but thank you very much for, um, for having me here today and to um, have a short discussion about uh, the root causes of migration. Um, there have been a lot of presentations today and a few more tomorrow, and we have touched upon many, many aspects of migration uh, today in, uh, from a Central Eastern European point of view. Um, my presentation is going to take you back to, um, to the root causes and to the problems that are connected with, uh, with determining what can be regarded as a root cause uh, of migration. Uh, migration itself, as you well know, uh, is known for thousands of years. And uh, we are often, we are often um, facing this, this problematic that people say, come on, why do we talk about migration? Migration is here with human history from the very beginning. Um, nevertheless, we surely realize that migration nowadays is, uh, is surely a phenomenon which is different from the times before, uh, because uh, nowadays we have um, distinct straight borders, we have uh, well-established societies who, um, who would like to uh, maintain um, their own uh, ways of life. And therefore, there are in the international community a wide range of rules um, which, uh, which regulate this said world order. Um, many regard that, that migration um, puts question marks to this said uh, world order, while others think that these question marks are very good and these question marks uh, should uh, or are the way uh, towards a better future. What is, what is sure is that there is a great increase or there was uh, a great increase in the magnitude, in the, uh, in the velocity, in the diversity of global communication and connections. And therefore, um, we can state that um, for uh, looking at migration, how it is nowadays, we, we have to take into consideration what are, um, that maybe communication is one of the drivers behind it. We're going to come back to that later. Uh, what is sure is that among the population worldwide, there is a growing awareness that um, there are re global relationships and that um, this, there is a growing recognition also of the, of the very possibilities how the borders uh, can be, um, can be trusted. And therefore, in the next few minutes, um, we're going to talk about the, um, the reasons of migration the newest reasons of migration, uh, and we are going to come back to, to my favorite issue, what is with the environmental challenges and the connection with it, with, uh, with migration. Um, one of the biggest challenges today, and uh, hardly there is anyone in, in this room who hasn't had to touch upon the topic of, um, of the terminology issues. As lawyers, we are always facing the problems how to define something. And I think definition is one of the, of the key issues today when we talk about migration. There are tendencies which, um, which try to, um, to claim or uh, try, to, try to disregard the borders of certain notions and, and uh, definitions. And therefore, the biggest challenge today is to determine exactly what is behind the concrete notions. Um, we've talked about migrants, asylum seekers, we've talked about refugees, and when we talk about the root causes of migration, we're going to come um, shortly to the conclusion that in some places uh, we are not uh, talking about migrants anymore, but up to another group of people. Um, the problem is that while there is the Geneva Convention, which we know very well, and which is yeah, far more than a half a century year old, which may cause problems, um, then, uh, and there's a strict definition for, um, for a refugee in it. Um, we may criticize it from, from various aspects. Let's just put it on the table, the definitions there. On the other hand, when we, um, when we look at uh, the definition of migration, we have different types of, of definitions. Um, for instance, the, um, the shortest version is, or one of the shortest versions is, one of the, uh, one of in the United Nations recommendations uh, on statistics of international migration, and it says that migrant is a person who has changed his or her country uh, of usual residence. That's the shortest version. The, um, the FAO um, has a much, much longer definition about who is a, a migrant and what is migration. Um, of course, including all the uh, agricultural aspects uh, here. What is, 
for us as lawyers very important is how the international community and the international legal system reacted to these changes and what um, is accepted by the international community as being um, um, relevant for, for one status or the other. As to the international community, we can say that we distinguish between short-term and long-term migrants. Um, the United Nations accepts this, uh, this type of order, and, uh, and typically it's the, um, it's the country, country's choice what duration uh, of residence it requires. Uh, and of course, apart from international migration, we can't forget that there is a huge amount of internal migration where no border crossing happens, and I'm going to come back with some statistics later on uh, for this um, yeah, phenomenon. Usually and traditionally, we distinguish between conflict-driven um, displacement or economically motivated uh, migration. And what concerns the conflict-driven driven, uh, displacements, uh, it was usually to prevent uh, violence or um, uh, to end certain human rights abuses. Uh, while on the economic side, um, usually um, people tried to, to um, put an end to this, to this uh, phenomenon by alleviating poverty and uh, creating jobs. Um, in reality, of course, in the majority of the cases, it's a mixture. What is interesting is that one of the most influential organizations in this regard, the IOM, uh, regards that the second option, the economically motivated migration, is actually false. Uh, and they claim that the researchers have demonstrated that actually uh, socioeconomic development in poor countries rather tends to increase migration rather than to reduce it. Um, I'm very skeptical about this. Uh, um, this type of statement, but nevertheless, it's on the table. So um, I think we have to regard that maybe there are other types of, um, of interests and, and um, questions put here as to how we define and why do we define um, the roots uh, of migration. Um, typically, of course, armed conflicts or um, or repression or, of course, social breakdown can be regarded as the uh, major cause of migration, but then we come back to the definition of the Geneva Convention, and then uh, we can say that many of these cases are going to belong under the, uh, the Geneva Convention on refugees. So uh, what is important is that we usually talk about the south to north, so global south to global north uh, migration, um, which is typical but it's not the only one. So there is a south-south, north-north, and north-south uh, migration as well. Um, but surely um, the south to north uh, migration is the biggest uh, globally, approximately 40%, at least over 30, so approximately 40%. South-south uh, uh, south is 37%, um, north-north is 19, and the uh, remaining four is uh, between north. Um, and to to these figures, we can add that uh, that approximately, uh, of course, it's a um, it's a number from a, from a few years back, uh, but a few years back there has been uh, 740 million internal migrants who we're not going to touch upon um, in this um, in this presentation today. So migration has several forms. What I told you that the typical is uh, south to north. Um, that means that uh, there are, uh, in certain cases, uh, certain long-term corridors, so corridors which work for a very, very long um, time frame. For instance, from the Syrian Arab Republic to Turkey, that is regarded as the second largest uh, corridor um, in the world, while, uh, of course, the European Union and the United States of America um, are, uh, are one of the major, major targets and um, where, the, where people who are migrating are heading to. But um, regarding the stati statistics, 30.9% um, of the international migrants, over 80 billion, million people, uh, are heading to, uh, to Europe, while 30 to Asia and uh, uh, 20 to North America. Um, however, uh, when we look at the proportion of the population, uh, Europe is only on place three. So that means that there are a lot, a lot of factors when we regard that migration. 
um, when we come to the drivers of migration, what may be regarded as the root cause of migration, uh, there are typical uh, drivers, um, for instance, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, environmental change or a conflict, or of course, uh, global inequalities, which, uh, which are much more evident right now in the times of, of mobile phones. Um, it is obvious that people are usually motivated by, by economic opportunities. Uh, they would like to live um, a better quality of life. Nobody can blame them for it. Um, but it's also um, very, um, very typical that uh, it's not families who, who get on the move, but only one or two people, and they send their support back home um, to their families. Um, of course, personal safety and security are also a reason um, to, to get on the roads, and uh, even more, education um, to be available is one of the reasons why people leave um, their home countries. We much talked about, also in the media, about push and pull factors. Um, I don't know who of you remembers, but I can uh, easily remember autumn 2015. Uh, when we were um, considering what can be a, a pull factor, um, for instance, when, uh, when Germany uh, decided how it decided in September, um, what um, was regarded as, a, as a, um, an invitation uh, in, the, in the international press as well. But um, pull factors may be um, various reasons. For instance, uh, individual commissions, uh, what I mentioned, sorry, for instance, um, depending on the resources of somebody or the personality or the certain skills. Uh, of course, the family ties and the uh, family networks are very, very important. It's, uh, it's uh, even more visible right now. And also um, some macro dynamics, for instance, uh, the socioeconomic opportunities or even, and that is important, the migration regimes which each and every country uses. Um, in Europe, I think in the last few years, we have seen that there is a huge difference between the migration um, theory of the of the different states and uh, you can see it on the uh, on the attitude of migration that they take into consideration uh, what is happening in each of the countries I have a very good friend who's been working um, in uh, in Belgium in the times when the peak of the migration was going on she and she volunteered uh, to an, to a civil organization to help the uh, the arriving migrants and uh, and she told a lot of interesting facts, uh, many of whom I can't he uh, tell you here in this, but privately I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, but, but she said that there, were, uh, there was actually an industry for informing the coming people about each and every single opportunity, even when it meant contouring the law. So even when it meant how to play out the Belgian rules of migration. Um, and. Uh, and it shows that, that actually, even we can't say why, but there was a massive power um, which, uh, which was trying to, to help um, the migration at the time coming to the, to the European Union. Um, of course, there are also push factors. Um, apart from the drivers, um, food insecurity is one of the major, major issues. Um, I think nobody can blame uh, that a family gets on the move in order to get uh, every kid f fed in the family. Poverty, less of access, less of lack of access to, to markets, as this is what the FAO underlines, to me one of the major push factors, uh, of course, um, from the agricultural point of view. But also there is um, the straight fragility, the political factors, um, the very poor urban planning, uh, which, which may be regarded as, uh, as push factors. And, of course, many, many of the movements, uh, how long they take, that means how far people get depends on the financial resources uh, of the people um, regarded. And there is one more uh, notion which we have to put on the table that is triggers. So um, while drivers are the slow onset pressures, um, while the triggers are the sudden events which happen like outbreak of a war, a flood, a drought, uh, something that was not foreseen uh, beforehand. And of course, um, here again, we come to um, a, a notion where we have to find 
the, the legal uh, connection between the Geneva Convention and the, and the exact situation of the person. Because here again, there is a clear distinction as, as accepted by the international community of what, is, uh, what can be regarded to be eligible for a refugee status and what not. Um, what, is, um, what is also important and can be regarded as a, as, um, well, a kind of solution for the future that why root causes are important, why the drivers or the triggers are important, why do we have to know what we are facing, because many people and many, many uh, reports that we are, um, we are reading, we can read that these things are not important, it's only the human which counts. But exactly because it's the human which counts, or who counts, it's important uh, why they started to get on the move, because if we know it, then we can um, solve the situation, and it's very different why, um, if, if a family comes because they can't survive because of a flood, and they plan to go back, or if somebody is coming because they simply uh, do not uh, want to, to live on their former usual place of, uh, uh, of, uh, of living beforehand. So um, there are a li little different um, protection frameworks valid for, um, for these, um, these types of people. What we know is that uh, one category is re relatively new, and that is the climate or environmental migrants, or as some call it, climate or environmental refugees. Um, there's a UNESCO paper um, from the past few years which um, calls the attention to the fact that while it's very, very um, in the mode to, um, to, uh, to cite climate refugees, uh, it is, uh, in fact, never elaborated. So nobody really determines what is the situation for it, what lays behind it, and by the way, what are the numbers which, um, which are behind it. So usually we shall need um, a lot more information about that, and there shall be a lot more um, numbers available for, this, for these reasons. So um, apart from the, uh, the security reasons, which we have already uh, mentioned, which we're going to not talk about anymore, which are and can be um, interconnected, just look at the, um, uh, the, what happens a few, uh, a few weeks ago. In the uh, in the Kakovka Dam in the Nipme River, it was connected. So it was a war, and it was a huge environmental catastrophe, which which happened. So there can be combinations of the two, um, but what I think is a is a um, very bad attitude if we disregard uh, the relationship between environmental change and human mobility. And of course, when we regard the environmental factors, there might be um, foreseeable catastrophes. For instance, if we, uh, we might all remember the Bhopal catastrophe, for instance, so when we human activity, which is which is done in a way that that can lead to a tragedy easily, or when it comes um, when it comes to slow onset processes like um, certain aspects of climate change or uh, when it comes to Wismayor events, which are really unpredictable uh, and cannot be, nothing can be done against them. So um, what is one more thing that I would like to say before the, the president asks me to, to stop, <laughs> is that, uh, that what counts is that we, can, um, we, have, to, we have to see the exact uh, reasons why somebody is migrating or somebody is seeking um, habitual residence in another country. Um, because that gives us an idea about how uh, we can, we can um, handle the situation. Many claim that it is very false uh, from certain countries, and I'm not naming any examples, who would like to stop migration or at least reduce its number. Um, but I think that uh, when we regard at the international security questions, uh, it's uh, more than understandable that we would like to understand this phenomenon, that we would like to um, maintain certain um, facts that are already, uh, or word order that is already existing. And um, I'm, very much, um, I'm very much surprised to see, I don't know if you've heard this, uh, this definition beforehand, uh, but uh, many papers refer to environmental refugees as 
um, agent of adaptation. This is the way how to adapt ourselves to, to the climate changes or the, um, the environmental effects which happen. Uh, on the other hand, I think that international law is not yet uh, prepared mm -hmm. to handle this, um, these conflicts. Uh, international law um, hasn't uh, done much um, in, the, in the past years to, to handle this question. Uh, refer to the Geneva Convention, I think that's not the best line uh, what um, even UN, UN institutions do sometimes, that they take the old text, which is old, I admit, that's the sign, uh, the, the old text and they try to find uh, with interpretation a new meaning, uh, a meaning which was not in the in the original text and a, a meaning which was never understood by the states who have to handle the concrete situations. So I'm for um, having a very uh, well-assessed look into the root causes of migration. Uh, and uh, with regard to um, the responses that we are giving at an international level, I think that the, the answers have to be complex because otherwise uh, we are not going to take into consideration the rights and interests of either those who are on the move and those who are where they are and would like to stay there just beforehand. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.